Hey there, art nerds. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about one of the OG art influencers slash influential artists, Jane Davenport. And today, we're going to be talking about both beautiful faces as well as fabulous figures. And I am going to be reviewing her Layer Cakes Sweet Treats palette. So we have a three part review, two books and one paint set. I am both really excited and a little trepidatious about today's review. I am also recording this like two weeks after I did a lot of the initial bulk of the review. And in the interim, I caught COVID at a friend's wedding. So if I sound kind of weird or look kind of awful, in this beginning segment, it's because I'm still recovering from being very, very, very sick due to a friend's negligence. Super appreciate that gift. So um, anyway, trying to cheer up, trying to be in good spirits, trying to make sure I project. And I do want to point out that reviews are for consumers. Book reviews are for people who might be interested in the books. This is not aimed at Jane, Jane Davenport herself. This is a good faith review of two books that I purchased out of pocket over on Amazon using funds from my Patreon, as well as a good faith review of a watercolor product that I have purchased from her website and had shipped to me from Australia here to the US. So all of this was done in good faith. That said, I have reviewed Jane Davenport art supplies before, specifically the American Crafts collaboration that she sold through Michael. So I do actually have some experience with her art supplies and I do have some expectations of how her art supplies have historically handled for me. Once again, reviews are for consumers and honestly for people who are just curious about art supplies and art books, you might watch this review and you might think these books are perfect for what you're looking for and you may go out and buy them. You may watch this review and decide these are not for you and you would rather spend your money elsewhere. Both are valid. I'm not here really to persuade or dissuade you one way or the other. I'm just here to share my thoughts, my opinions, what I found helpful, what I didn't find helpful, and to also share some relevant tutorials when I have, when I find areas that are a little bit lacking in these books. And there are some areas that I found to be a little bit lacking. I share some of my own tutorials because we all learn differently. We benefit from different ways of explaining things and seeing different examples and different ways of kind of breaking the world down around us. So if you find her books to not be helpful, you might find my tutorials to be helpful or some of the other resources that I recommend today to be helpful. Conversely, you may have tried those things and you may find them not to be helpful and you may find Jane Davenport's books to be helpful. But my goal is not to um, talk you into or talk you out of something that you weren't already kind of leaning towards. So um, when it comes to the layer cake set, I was actually pretty uh, open-minded about it. I was excited by what she said in the listings. I was interested in trying that out. And I was hoping that they would deliver everything that was promised. So I hope you enjoy today's review of fabulous figures, beautiful faces, and the Sweet Treats Layer Cakes palette. Hey guys, today we're talking about Jane Davenport and we're going to start with her drawing and painting Beautiful Faces, which is a quarry book, which is an imprint from Quattro. This book was published in 2015 initially and she has come out with many more books since and it, the MSRP is $24.99. It is a full color book. So before we really dive in to Jane, I want to, I just want to have a little Mr. Rogers talk with you guys. All right. So we don't have to have the same opinions. 
you can like something that I dislike and your opinion is valid. I can dislike something that you like and my opinion is valid. Both things can exist. Different art supplies suit different artists and that is why reviews are so helpful is different artists have different viewpoints. I am a watercolor comic artist and illustrator. I review things from that lens. If you don't like that lens, that is fine. You could choose to not watch. You could watch and then share your experiences respectfully down in the comments below, or you could watch and maybe learn something new. I love watching artists and craftspeople who do things I don't do and have a different way of looking at things or handling things. I think that's really exciting and it gives me all kinds of ideas and inspiration. We don't have to agree. I hate Van Gogh watercolors. Lots of people love Van Gogh watercolors. I don't care for Cotman. Lots of people like Cotman. I'm not a super big fan of Mungio watercolors. Lots of people like Mungio watercolors. Some people can paint with Crayola. I cannot paint with Crayola. Does that make them wrong? No. Does that make me wrong? No. We are all entitled to have our own likes, dislikes, and preferences. The only time I have a problem is when people are being transphobic, homophobic, or racist. That is the only time I will delete a comment. You don't have to like me. You don't have to like what I do, but we're going to be respectful and respectable to one another here because this is a safe space for all different kinds of artists. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because I've noticed that some people have really big love real big parasocial relationships with some of these art influencers. And I don't know these people. I have never met these people. We do not talk. We are not friends. We are not enemies. We have no interactions. All of the things that I have purchased for this series, I have purchased with funds from Patreon. All of them were good faith purchases with maybe the exception of if I ever buy the Stuart Simple watercolor palette because I have some thoughts about that one. But none of them were purchased so I could just hate it. That's a waste of money. That's a waste of resources. So all of my opinions are just that. They're just opinions. I try to give you guys page numbers. I try to give you guys citations. I try, if I'm reviewing a watercolor, I tell you what I'm swatching it on and what I'm swatching it with. I try to be as transparent as possible so you can decide if the information I'm providing is useful to you or not. That's why I talk about being a watercolor comic artist so much is y'all might not find that beneficial to you. And that is okay. That is valid. I'm not here to yuck your yum, but not everybody is going to be everybody's taste. So we're talking about Jane today and I know that people, there's some big love for Jane Davenport's art. I really like her art too. Um, I am excited about this book, but I will also point out I have reviewed her art supplies in the past. I reviewed two of her watercolor palettes and her mermaid markers, and I have very mixed feelings about her art supplies. I will link what I reviewed and also putting clips over to the side so you guys can check it out, but I'm not planning on buying, well, that's not, that's kind of a lie. All right, so let's, let's actually just go ahead and get started on this. So I am doing my best to bring Jane Davenport vibes here today. I've got cute heart glasses. I've got a cute ponytail. I've got cute earrings. I've got rainbow coveralls. I've got a mushroom shirt and I've got a beautiful little color wheel pin. So I'm trying to bring my respect and my enjoyment and my appreciation because I love, I love how she dresses. I love how she presents herself. So bright, so colorful, so fun. I'm here for it. I love the rainbow energy. Yes. So um, I have no, I've been a fan of her work for a while. I've been on her mail, mailing list for a while. I reviewed a few of her products for a while. I didn't realize this, but doing my research for this, uh, I was following Institute of Cute in like 2009. And I have to say, just like as a personal moment, not that I think Jane is watching this, but just as a personal moment, a beautiful takeaway, you were such a big inspiration to me back then because I was a girl from Southeast Louisiana with a manga influence to her art style and everybody hated it. And everybody wanted me to be somebody else. All of my professors were like, stop drawing cute, stop drawing girls, stop drawing same face. And some of those things did need to change, but reading your blog, Reading your blog in 2009 
showed me that there were other people who liked the same things that I liked. There were other people who vibed on the same wavelength and that I could keep elements of what I loved while still improving other elements. So Institute of Cute was actually a big deal to me. You and Mizuno Junko were very inspirational at a time when I really needed that inspiration. So this is, this is coming from like a weird vibration place of like, I used to be a huge fan of your work. And not that I'm not a fan now, not that I don't enjoy it now, but it was there for me when I really needed it to be there for me. So thank you so much, Jane, because I'd forgotten about that until like I started doing my research. And then I was like, wait, she did Institute of Cute? How did I forget this? That said, she currently sells, She's she was in Michael's doing a collab with American Crafts. She's no longer doing that collab. And I apologize for the AC unit, Southeast Louisiana, y'all. I'm not kicking off the AC. So she sells her art supplies on her own um, online shop. And I believe she has an in-person storefront in Australia as well. I have noticed that a lot of the art supplies on her site are AliExpress packaging, repackaging, like white label from AliExpress. And I've reviewed a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff, like, like a lot, a lot of stuff from AliExpress, especially if you guys check out my student grade showdown. I've reviewed a lot of stuff from AliExpress or are fairly overpriced. So I decided I wasn't going to buy anything new for the series from her site. Um, but I did actually want to try to get a hold of her layer cakes because they're like this neat gouache watercolor hybrid and like a makeup tin and they just appeal to me. I wanted to try them out. The only place I could find her layer cakes was in a $90 ish ish numbers, not my strong suit. I'll put it here. Not the shot I wanted, but hopefully you guys can't hear the AC unit as much. I don't know, they're so loud here. We have these huge, we have two huge in-house AC units because it gets very, very hot. Um, I wanted to try her layer cakes. She only had one listing for them. It was for a very expensive bundle of the layer cakes. I am not that amount of money interested in buying the layer cakes and like nobody else sells them. So I'm not actually going to be reviewing a product in this review but I have reviewed her products before. So, um, so um, today I'm gonna take a look at both of her books. We're taking a look at Beautiful Faces as well as Fabulous Figures, but we're gonna kind of mix things up. So we're gonna do a book review, we're gonna take a look at her social media, and then we're gonna do another book review. And I'm interested in seeing how our approaches differ as she trained in Paris as a fashion designer, and I have an MFA in sequential art from SCAD. So we're both higher levels of training. I feel like Jane and the Ranger slash Tim Holtz crew are like OG social media art influencers. She has a lot of books and workshops available. While I like Jane's art and I do, while I like Jane's art, I do want to point out that there are a lot of anatomical liberties taken for design and emphasis sake. Something that I feel like I should probably embrace more. I tend to get very static and stiff. Okay, hopefully that's better with the AC units. You don't get to see my backyard or the nice sunset golden hour we got going on, but at least the noise will be better. Also, Bowie was outside with me and I just brought him in, so it's not like I need to be able to keep an eye on the backyard through my viewfinder. Although realistically, I'm facing the yard. Becca! So anyway, um, there's a lot of wonkiness going on with her art, but it's for effect and it's for design and it is a deliberate choice that she's making and that's I need to give myself permission to kind of free myself up to do that as well because I get very tight and very constrained and very anxious about my art. Can you tell? Do I look like someone who gets anxious about my art? Her table of contents is a little hard to read against the background, but that just goes to show you that this is a full color, full bleed book. And she covers a lot of different media in this rather short book. It's kind of like those DK how to art books. So let me see if I can find it. I had noticed that at first in the supplies me section. And each one of those media is like one to two pages long. It's really not in depth enough to be useful. I kind of, I know she loves all the art supplies. Like I get it, she's got rainbow itis. I get that. I also love all the art supplies, but she needs to pare it down because this is a thin book. 
because I am kind of already starting to take notes and make notes for my own watercolor book that I'm going to self-publish because why would I wait on a publisher? Um, I made the note to niche down because that way I can talk more about that niche. We do actually see some shots of what she says is her studio on page 10, but I find it hard to believe that that little table is her workspace. This girl has a lot of art supplies. Give me the real real. Like, how do you set it up? Um, as somebody who also has a lot of art supplies that I would like to have out and around me so I'll actually use them, I'd like to see how she sets her studio up so I can kind of pattern my own after her because I am always looking for good art studio inspiration ideas that aren't just like, look at my aesthetic workspace, but like, I actually make stuff here. Here is how I manage the dragon horde. Now, uh, Jane owns an art supply store. She mentions this on page 13. She also mentions what brands she likes and she uses, which I appreciate. As you guys have noticed in the Easily Influenced series, some of these creators are very cagey about mentioning a specific brand name. Um, at first I thought it was like their publisher telling them not to, but we have a, we're doing a back to back today. I recorded two reviews in one day. So actually this is three because I'm re-recording the Jane after I re-recorded the Onmar Win. So speaking of, this is the Onmar Win book. This is also published by Quarry. This is Painting Beautiful Faces, also published by Quarry. And I thought for a while that it was a limitation on Quarry's part because I've had some interactions with them. They at one point approached me about doing a Making Comics book that fell through because their timelines are very, 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 very short. So I thought some of the things that I disliked about this book were their choices. Like um, I thought she didn't mention brands because they asked her not to because that might limit the audience. Um, I also thought all these tiny photos that are hard to see were Quarry's choice, like a limitation of the publishing and the short timeline. That said, same publisher. Now Jane Davenport might be a bigger name, so maybe she can kind of throw her weight around, but uh, she mentions brands, no problem, and I appreciate that. And she actually fills her pages, like her layouts are layouts. The photos are kind of too small, kind of hard to see, but she's using up more of the page. There's less just white space on the page. I also appreciate that she uses, she mentions brands because if you are someone who is a fan of her work and you're looking to replicate her techniques, you might want to try using the brand she's recommending because it's more likely that you can achieve the same techniques with what she's using, which is why I think it's so important when art influencers say they like something that it is actually something they use and they like and they stand by because y'all got a whole audience who's counting on you to not lead you astray. And it's why I'm so hard on some of these collabs because if you're going to put your name on it, it should be good. Your audience is going to buy this. I did ask if she used gesso for everything because it seems like she does. She does. That and fiber paste. Ain't nothing wrong with that, but that is a good amount of prep. Unlike me, whose book is falling apart. That is a good amount of prep, and that is actually some additional time. And it would have been nice if she mentioned whether she like gessoed a whole book in preparation so she can just make art when she's ready to make art, or if she gessoes it, waits, and then makes the art. It, seemed like, it seems like she does use gesso in her art journal, which kind of creates a paper canvas. She really likes to take up the page with hero images, which makes her a very appealing and engrossing book. And I am going to do a flip through so you guys can really see it. These individual medium sections don't cover a whole lot, but I feel like she's covering points unique to her and allowing us to just Google, Internet, DuckDuckGo, Bing, the rest. And I appreciate that. As I pointed out to you guys, a lot of these books cover the same material over and over and over again. And it's basically always the same stuff. And it feels very just wasteful, wasteful of their time, wasteful of my time, wasteful of the space. So I appreciate her putting her particular spin on it. It might also be all the pretty pictures selling me though. And that's okay too. I am along for the ride. So at this point in the book, I was here for it. I was here to learn how to draw and paint the Jane Davenport way. She did throw some products my direction that I've never heard of, like scribe all pencils, which are kind of like a china marker, but water soluble. Sounds really cool. And Dynaflow inks, which I've heard of before, but from her, and I have a hard time getting them in the U.S. 
I also get like really big retro shoujo energy. And this is really particularly true on page 33. This is one of her stencils. Tell me that is not retro shoujo vibes right there. Um, being an Aussie, I wonder how much candy candy they got and if that influenced her. Because I know they were getting anime over there way before we did. So that's something she might have grown up with. And that would be kind of neat as like a fellow inspired by anime and manga, seeing female creators over there making comics about girls and women at a time when that was not a thing here, that was not available here. I find that super inspiring, so it'd be cool. She has no shame mentioning her online workshops. Good for you, girl, get that coin. And oh man, do we have different approaches to constructing heads. I'm gonna link you guys some of my tutorials because if the way she does it doesn't work for you, maybe the way I do it will work for you. The way she does it is really similar to how a lot of the how to draw books teach this kind of thing. It's a little bit more colorful. There's maybe more focus on certain elements, but like the way she divides the face and the way she talks about the face, um, that's very similar to a lot of the how to draw books I grew up with. And I could not learn how to draw faces from that. I tried a bunch of them and I really struggled with them. And it wasn't until I came across Andrew Loomis and Glenn Vilpu that the volume clicked for me. So if her method doesn't work for you, maybe my method will. Speaking of self promo, by the way, if you sign up for my mailing list, you're going to get my manga madness class for free. It's all set up on notions. It's got videos, printables, handouts, a presentation, and it is great for drawing heads. And I go into a lot of detail about drawing individual features and how to change that up and different style inspirations. And I even talk about drawing ears, noses, and hands. And that's just if you sign up for my mailing list. I love that she like owns the page. They are full and they are well designed. And if you guys see me swatting, it is mosquito time. I am going to get encephalitis. The right hand pages are hero images that demo the technique for the most part, not always. There are some exceptions, but I like when she does it because it's like, here's the process and then here's the finished result. I love seeing that, especially being able to compare the two. I do get Loomis vibes with how she divides the face and for an alternative approach, check out his work. It's a bit dated, but I found it really helpful when I was learning. And he and Vilpu are kind of the, him, Vilpu, and Paul Hudson from SCAD are kind of the basis of how I think about these things. So far from what I've seen, she mostly draws women and there's not really a lot of expression variation. Everybody has same face. It's like they all have RBF and I have it so I know if I'm not making myself smile. Wait, let me do a flat affect for you guys. That's ADHD for you guys. If I'm not thinking about smiling or actually like having a fun conversation, um, my, my flat affect scares people. <laughs> people think I'm mad. So, you know, I can relate as a fellow RBF and I wonder if she's going to vary things up for this book. I have some tutorials on drawing expressions. I'll link them for you guys. I really think they're great little tutorials. They're very helpful and very step-by-step -step basic. So I hope you guys will check them out. I've noticed that students have trouble stylizing facial features and she kind of glosses over that on page 43. So I'll plug again, you know, it doesn't gloss over that my manga madness class. So I say that she does go into a little bit more detail further on, but she only shows you one way of drawing them. Let me show you guys, because I think it's worth, worth noting. So like for the mouth, she shows you one way of drawing lips and there's no expression, not open, not smiling, not frowning, like not mad, just one way of drawing lips, which when I think of beautiful faces, I think of a lot of expression, but I'm a comic artist and I love drawing really emotive characters. So that might be just my own bias and it might not bother other people as much. Like, I wanna know how she thinks about drawing the, the, the eyes the way she draws them or drawing the nose or drawing the mouth. I wanna get into her head and understand her logic. I wanna know the thought process behind it. Um, I also get big Disney vibes like golden age Glen Keane. 
Like, particularly when Prince Adam realizes he's not the beast anymore and he's a man and it's like, it's me, Belle. Uh, but primarily, I mean, like, his, his underdrawings for that, his pencil test for that, it kind of reminds me of that. And I'll include a clip for you guys. I love, I love Glenn Keane's art. His work and his daughter's work are hugely inspiring to me. So no shade, just, just an observation. There's a lot I'm not going to dig into about how she describes setting up the fates on page 46, but in the end, if it looks good, does it really matter? Like, are y'all, are those of you guys buying this book, are you really looking to like be a professional artist and be able to draw a variety of expressions or do you just want to draw a pretty face? If you just want to draw a pretty face, she's hitting the nail on the head. Because in the end, if it looks good, it doesn't really matter. And I might just be annoyed because it's not the way I was taught. And there's a lot of wiggle room and guesswork and like having to make inferences that I feel like would not be the easiest for a beginner. I feel like she's assuming a lot from the re readers and forgetting how little of this comes naturally to most people. Now, I teach in-person physical classes, so I see a lot of how much people are struggling with it and how much they're doubting themselves and how much encouragement they need. So that might be the difference between someone who primarily teaches workshops and online things to fans and someone who is teaching kind of random people who show up to the library for the class. They, most of them don't know me. So we don't have this established fan and creator relationship. So I get to really see what they're struggling with and what they would like to learn. There's more structured face tutorials out there, including my own. So if you're struggling to get it, I recommend Vilpu for drawing the head, Loomis for drawing the head, and Proko. Proko's got some great tutorials here on YouTube. On page 47, there is a symmetry exercise. And I think that's really fun. I think it's a good idea. It's a good way to kind of like get an idea for facial symmetry if you're struggling with it. But I do agree with her that the face doesn't need to be perfectly symmetrical. The halves of your face are sisters, not twins. And I think that imperfection adds a lot of visual interesting quirk. It adds some personality. Like uh, I have a, a smirk and it's only on the side of the face. If y'all like Jane's art, look into manga, comics, and cartooning. I've covered a lot of this for illustration and comics on the blog and here, and I would be happy to do more if that's something you guys would like to see. Cartoonists and comic artists don't get enough love. Cartoonists and comic artists don't get enough love. Uh, Grizz and Norm Tuesday tips would also be helpful. You guys would probably like them. I have the first two volumes if you guys are interested in seeing me do something like this, uh, where I talk about it and I show you things I like and I show you things... Probably, there's going to probably be very little I don't like if it's Grizz and Norm, but I could do that. Let me know down in the comments. And at this point, I was like, maybe I need to lighten up. I'm getting all head up because I teach this as well, just differently. So I decided to do a mental reframe in terms of this review. So she's getting to, this is going to kill me. She's getting people to see the head volumetric as a 3D shape on page 50. I'm also fighting the sunset. I tried recording indoors today. That was a total fail and getting them to think about feature how the features follow the face and change as you look around and i also thought that was good although she doesn't have like a turnaround view like them looking side to side i do though it would be great if she mentioned referencing especially like the shadows on the face there are some good resources to help you guys with that and i can do a tutorial if you guys are interested that would be great practice for me or referencing how features change as the viewing angle changes she kind of shows it, but she doesn't really explain it. There are some really good references for that online, so I hope you guys will check those out as well. Now, she finally goes into individual facial features on page 56, but it's super basic. It's like a page on drawing the lips, a page on drawing one type of nose, a page on drawing one type of eye, a pa the page on ears. Like, none of it goes super in detail and it doesn't show it from different views. That said, I keep forgetting that this is about drawing things Jane's way and not literally how to draw them more realistically or like how to think about the object and then abstracting them. This isn't about learning how to see the world and then draw it your way. This is about learning how to draw Jane's way. If you like Jane's art, then you probably already know it's pretty static and posed. Movement and expression come from the hair, her color choices and her collage elements. Like you know this already. If you're buying this book, you know those things, that's not gonna bother you. 
she also gives me margaret keen energy the the big eyes lady her work was really popular in the set well it was popular in the 70s her husband took a lot of credit for it um so like just the big eyes the kind of flat affect the very posed it's very margaret keen i like margaret keen's art i find it really inspiring um and i can really relate to that as well now all this said this makes sense to me because she comes from a fashion background but all of this made me curious about like how she originally became famous and how she built up a name. I first came across, I, I had forgotten she did Institute Cute and then I started digging. Um, I came across her work again in 2017 at Michael's with her watercolors and I couldn't really find much of what she did before I couldn't really find much of what she did before she became an influencer. Like with comic artists, you can find a webcomic or something. And I couldn't even find who she did art for or her, and her bios are just full of fluff. It's very like, how did you get to this point? I worked hard and dreamed big. Like that's not help. That's not telling me who you used to work for. Her first book about her artwork came out in 2015 with Corey. And when asked how she did it, she typically gives kind of a pat answer. Her mom, Liz Davenport, was a fashion designer and a businesswoman, and I wonder if maybe she gave Jane her start. Jane started the Institute of Cute, which was a concept store in Byron Bay and a gallery store, like selling her art in 2006, and it had start, first started the blog in 2008, and that's when I became first, first aware of her work. She went to the Paris Fine Arts Academy. She was a columnist for Cloth, Paper, Scissors. In 2010, she got into art journaling. In 2011, she started doing online classes, starting with Connie of Dirty Footprints, and she has worked with Artist Seller USA, as well as Peerless Watercolors. She has worked as a fashion illustrator, but I can't find where or for who. She has worked as a textile designer, can't find anything, as well as a fashion designer, can't find anything. She has also worked as a runway photographer and that actually got her kind of into photographing insects and there's several really beautiful books with her insect photography out on the market. So that's kind of cool. I love when people have like side quests in their lives that they're really into. The paint and create section on page 76 doesn't include enough process to help an actual novice but if you had four years of decent high school art or took a decent amount of art in college it's good inspiration because it's mostly just ideas it's like she took a few photos when she remembered while working as usual rather than projects designed for you to do there's a couple of exceptions to that but generally it that's the vibe i get i'll kind of flip through some of them but there's just not enough of the process for you to really see what she's doing and for you to really get a good idea. Like the pastels is not indicative of that, but like about half of these projects just don't really include enough photos and process for you to really understand how to replicate if you wanted to replicate what she's doing. Now I have complained in the past about art books that are like step one, step two, step three, and Jane does not do that and kudos to her, but I want more process and I want to get in her head more. I also wanna see if she keeps a sketchbook, if she, what her failures look like. I want all of that good dirt. Not that it's really dirt, it's just, it's just process and I love process. So that's not to say they're useless, just not particularly useful. And as someone who markets herself as a dream maker, they should be in more depth, especially for a $25 art book. It really feels like it's rather short. And I didn't pay 20, I think I paid 11 for this, but that's the market price. There are some fun ideas like the light and shadow map on page 82, and we are losing the light. So this is gonna be a race. So here's the light and shadow map like the light and shadow map on page 82, but projects like Layer Love on page 84 move too fast for you to see what she's doing or how she's doing it. Working on top of collage seems cool. She does that on page 87. I've never done it. And while I think I could muddle through with this tutorial, it's all guesswork and relying on my prior experience with acrylics. And not everyone in your audience is gonna come from an art background. All these ladies with broken necks is kind of distracting. And she does actually address that. She refers to it as swan necks and she says that it gives personality and she just wants us to give our necks some shape. And I can respect that. It was really the Frida Kahlo neck 
that I'm about to show you guys that like <laughs> just really did it for me. Like she's got extra extra joints in her neck, you know? Like her chiropractor bills, her massage bills must be through the roof. I do like creating order out of chaos, so maybe I should try collage. Her alcohol marker process in Dreamy Skin Tones on page 92 features the most step-by-step -step process I've seen from this book. All projects should be in this, all projects should be this in depth. The ADHD is just making the word salad. This exercise here. Now I have loads of marker tutorials and reviews. I'm going to scroll through them and link some of the major playlists in the description for you guys. The technique used in the exercise making cloud on page 103, a water-based marker looks interesting, but it's hard to follow. There's just not enough photos, not enough information. She's introducing a concept. And the thing is, if she had a YouTube channel where she did these, if she had a TikTok, if she had an Instagram where she demonstrated these things, I would be much more lenient about how hard it is to follow. Cause it's like, okay, we can, this is, this is just like a roadmap of projects. I can go watch them for free. She is selling this as a course though. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. On page 113, she mentions water uh, using fiber paste. Now I've used watercolor ground, but I've never used fiber paste. Let me know if they're actually the same product under different names. On page 114, she says, prepare a page with fiber paste. What does that mean? How do I prepare a page with fiber paste? I can kind of guess, but we should know, especially since a lot of her audience is new to te these techniques. She should really go to the trouble to explain it. She also never showed us how to draw more than one expression or even how to draw an open mouth. She does have an exercise where someone's mouth is parted open and it's a beautiful face, but she doesn't show us how to actually do that. She just assumes we should know. I've encountered the, the pillow method of thinking about the mouth elsewhere. There are other tutorials that kind of combine the pillow method. In fact, I use the pillow method and I talk about it in Manga Madness and I talk about wrapping the face around a tin can for the bottom of the face to give it more volume. So if that sounds helpful to you guys, you know, you should check it out. Also, I'm going to be scratching, I'm going to be touching, I'm going to be swatting because the mosquitoes want to carry me off. On page 132 and 133, it is a big ad for the e-course of Beautiful Faces. They call this my invitation. So not to be like too critical, too judgmental, but I kind of feel like the book is meant to sell the course, but in order to take the course, you need to have bought the book. So they're meant to go together. We're like, why not just sell them together? Why not just make it more expensive and sell the two together? Especially if you're only gonna like touch on some things rather than really going into them. So my final thoughts for this book. I got a lot of flack over the years for drawing same face, for drawing static poses, and for drawing mostly women. As a comic artist, I get it. I need to practice variety of subjects. It's exciting to see women artists draw figurative work, especially popular artists or artists with a heavily caricatured st style and cartoony inclinations. As a comic artist who has her feet in web comics, I know there are a lot of femme identifying AFAB and women of all types working in comics. I'm aware of that. I'm talking about it's exciting to see those people in a more like magazines, like brand collabs, like that kind of space because we're never or barely ever considered for that kind of thing. So it's exciting to see somebody with that kind of an art style get that kind of recognition. I do want to see Jane's earlier work. I love seeing how artists develop and how, where they get their inspirations and who taught them what, um, like pre-Institute of Cute, but I couldn't find anything on it. And this series is not a deep dive. I am not deep diving. I am not digging. I am not looking for dirt. We're not using the Wayback Machine for this. We are looking at the things that are their surface level face value. So it would have been cute to see some of her earlier work. I, maybe it's on her site and I didn't dig deep enough. Um, but I would have liked to have seen some of her earlier work, even some of her work from when she was like a teenager, you know, her art is beautiful, but a whole book 
of the same face and expression gets a bit old, especially to a comic artist where expressions and movement are valued. It really shows that people value what is popular. I know so many awesome webcomic and comic folk who really could do a more in-depth job teaching how to draw faces. And I do think these publishers need to look to comics and webcomics for your talent in these how to draw books, especially if you're targeting teens. I know Beautiful Faces is not targeting teens, it's targeting me's, but like if you want the teen demographic, look to web comics and webtoons for artists who can teach that or me, I could do that. But let's be real, we bought this to we bought this book to draw like Jane does, and in an attempt to cover it all, a lot is left untaught. And unlike some of our easily influenced artists, Jane doesn't have a YouTube channel of three tutorials. It's books and paid workshops. So you should either pay the money, turn elsewhere, or give up. And I don't like those options. If you've taken any of Jane's workshops, I would love to hear about your experiences. Did you enjoy them? Did you find them helpful? Does she work very closely with the people taking her workshops? Does she check over your work and provide feedback? I want to know. Let me know. So now let's take a look at Jane on social media. It is time to take a look at Jane Davenport's web presence. So just a super friendly reminder, this is not a deep dive. We are not digging. It is all stuff that is very internet facing, very internet forward because we're not interested in like doxing anybody. We're just interested in taking a look at their social media presence, how they present themselves, what they have on offer and what we can learn about what they have on offer. So I have DuckDuckGoad, Jane Davenport, and her website is popping up. It's like right underneath the eBay and Amazon ads, so not bad. And welcome to a haven of color, unique art supplies, books, and lessons to help you create with freedom. So we have that artist introduction right here. You could get to know her. She refers to hoarding art supplies as rainbow itis. I just refer to it as hoarding art supplies because that's what I do. She ha she sells art supplies. She has workshops and then she has books. We are here today because of the books. We have taken a look though at her art supplies in the past. She has a bunch of workshops. I've scrolled through some of them with you guys already. And she's also got a lot of products. We're going to Definitely talk about that 
in a little bit. We also have a bunch of testimonials. So um, in the past, I've asked you guys if I can do like reader quotes uh, and people were kind of confused why I would want reader quotes on these kind of websites. They are very, these kind of testimonials are super, super popular. So if you ever say something nice and I ask if I can use it, it's because I need your permission to do so. And it's because it actually does help show other people that real humans are getting value from what I have to offer. Her site is very reedy and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like old internet was everything was very reedy, right? Like lots and lots and lots of reading, but we've kind of moved to a point where I feel like the front part of your website and maybe I'm, I'm a hypocrite. Maybe my website is also way too reedy, but I feel like the front part of your website should be more punchy, more photos and short blurbs. And then if people want to get to know you a little bit better, then it should be then it should be more reedy, but that's more just like me thinking about how I can improve my own website, right? And uh, she has had stuff at Michael's. I've never seen her stuff at Hobby Lobby. I don't even know what Hobby Craft is. And as for a bestseller on Amazon, that might be true, but I can't actually find her products on Amazon currently. Like I went on there looking for her layer cakes because I would like to try them. And uh, her site is the only site that sells them. And a while back, I was thinking about buying her new watercolors and uh, they were very price prohibitive. And then the shipping from Australia was even more price prohibitive. So I, I feel you, my South American friends who <laughs> comment that everything I talk about is very, very expensive for them. I feel you in this in this moment. So she has a blog. If I can get it. There we go. So also very colorful. She's got these really cute illustrations up here at the top. She's got, the, they are very inviting blog posts. Like you definitely do want to click on them. I am on her mailing list. So I have, I think I get all of this anyway. Um, and I think, and not that there's anything wrong with like recycling content. We, I certainly do. Um, but I think her blog and her mailing list are a lot of the same content. So we're we already took a look at beautiful faces. We're going to take a look at fab fabulous figures. I don't know why I can't talk today, but she's got several books out. Like she's got what? Do, okay, for any of you guys who have done any of the journals, like a lot of these art influencers slash influential artists have journals out. Could you? Would you like get in contact with me and like give me an idea, like some photos or something of what these journals look like? How they handle? Are they blank? Are they actually very fleshed out? Do you find them to be helpful tools? Like, give me the deets. I actually, when I go to my Michaels, they don't have most of these books. They certainly don't have the journals. And when I go to my Barnes and Noble, they don't either. So the only way for me to find out is you guys to let me know or for me to buy one. And I just, I'm not a good journal keeper. So I just can't see that being worth the money. Whimsical Girls, Marvelous Mermaids, Whimsical and Wild the garden ga guardians and she does do some really beautiful insect photography as you guys can see here i love it when artists have like a second life that people don't necessarily know about and then she also does combos of books and workshops and we kind of talked about that with beautiful faces so uh fabulous figures has one beautiful faces whimsical and wild my problem i felt with beautiful faces is that for a lot of the projects, she didn't go in depth enough for me to find the book to be particularly useful. So it kind of feels like she's really just selling the workshop in that regards. And I, I kind of don't like that because I feel like the info should have been in the book to begin with, but maybe I'm the only one who feels that way. She also has bundles like the fabulous figure bundle comes with these. I like how when I scroll over it, it just totally whites out. So we can't see anything. I know that's like a common internet thing, but I still, still don't love it. Um, comes with, it looks like her decoupage slash tissue transfers, if I'm seeing it correctly, in her washi tape. I guess like maybe to get you started with the faces. And then Whimsical Girls comes with color pencils as well as, so you see this here. This is a superior watercolor watch that I have reviewed that she now white labels and we can talk about that. 
the whimsical and wild comes with these ink refills and her mermaid markers which i actually really like and i reviewed a while back imagine out loud comes with the rainbow twirl pencil lovelet tin is she doing this on purpose like i do that on purpose like tank or is it i can't always tell Marvelous Mermaid Bundle comes with the, these are makeup brushes. They, they're makeup brushes, y'all. They probably handle like makeup brushes. They look like they would be uncomfortable to paint with. Um, and that's something that I've seen a lot of people who like Jane Davenport's work in general and like some of her products, but then they feel like a lot of her other products are like makeup products that have been slightly modified for the art market. And as someone who loves aesthetic art supplies, I don't really have a problem with that in theory, but a lot of makeup stuff is just frankly not comfortable to use as art supplies. And I've done a couple makeup challenges and I would be down to do another make art from makeup challenge because um, it can be fun, but the, the supplies themselves are actually kind of painful to make art with sometimes. And then the Beautiful Faces Bundle which comes with a signed copy of the book. Do they all come with, they all come with a signed copy. Okay. Um, a fabulous kit of art supplies and it doesn't actually detail what the art supplies are right here. And I'm, we, we're on a time budget here. She does have print. I feel like the last time I came to her site, just like to browse, to fair, it was on mobile. I didn't realize she had prints. I'm kind of curious if she's got some of the pieces that I was like, oh, I really like this as a print. This one's really pretty. I really like that one. Oh, and she's got wall decals. That's kind of fun. And wearable art as well. So she's got some kits. That's cool. I like when artists sell practical items as well because sometimes you want to own something of theirs and you can't justify yet another print, but you could justify a tote bag or a tea towel. And then we've already kind of looked at the workshops through like me scrolling through them for you guys. And that was just a newsletter she had sent out. She is always be promoting ABP. And if you've taken one of her workshops and you've enjoyed it or you didn't enjoy it, I'd love to hear from you. A lot of these artists offer behind the, behind the curtain, I want to say, workshops where it's like an online workshop and you can't really see what's being offered in the workshop and you can't really tell how much one-on-one. -on -one. Like, okay, like Skillshare is on a platform that's set up a certain way so you can expect certain things. And uh, Domestica, same thing. But when people privately host these kind of website workshops, it can be hard to tell how in-depth they're going to be. Some of them are really in-depth and they have a Discord server and they are constantly critiquing one another's work and providing feedback and they're great. And some of them are, it's just like a series of classes that you do at your own pace, you never turn anything in. And some people can benefit from either of those, but if you have a learning disability, being able to check in and being held accountable for doing things by a certain time can be really helpful. So it would just be interesting to know how these are structured and whether you find that they're beneficial to you. She has a lot of art supplies, but a lot, but okay, the way she kind of phrases it kind of bums, bugs me because she acts like she's developed all these things. A lot of these things, and some of them are developed by her, but a lot of these things are from AliExpress and have been, or like other vendors like Superior, and they've been white labeled. That doesn't mean she developed it. It means she went out and found it, which is fine. It's just like the wording kind of gets me. So they do, they do ship, uh, but I found their U.S. shipping was kind of prohibitive. They do have a lot of art supplies. Uh, see, it's the design by an artist for artists, whereas, and, and she does have an import in-person brick and mortar store, at least according to her books. So this might be true for her in-person store. I don't find it to be true of her online shop. And I browse her online shop a lot. <laughs> 
lot. I'm always looking for interesting and unique art supplies to talk about here. So I like some of what she does and some of it's really interesting and it might just be out of my budget to buy it or out of my budget to buy it and then ship it over here. Um, so I do look a lot. I like her art and I like a lot of her ideas. I just don't necessarily like the uh, implication that she's the one designing and handpicking some of these things. And we'll talk about that. So these are the new layer cake wheels. They're kind of, um, she used to do the layer cakes as like an eyeshadow style palette. This is more like a blusher palette or even like a pan pastel. I guess, I guess if you guys are interested in seeing me take a look, I would, I want like a lot of colors, but I don't want a lot of paint because like, let's be real, the chances of me using it all up are slim to none. So I want like to try all the colors, but I don't want to invest in a lot of paint. That's why I like dot cards so much. And it just doesn't seem like she's in that direction anymore. Whereas the eyeshadow style layer cakes were more along that direction. And then she's offering these drafting pencils now. Like, oh my goodness, they look like the graph gears. They're not graph gears, but they look like the graph gears that have been around forever. And then we have like technical pencils. These look like our technical pens. These look like the Muji technical pens. This is what I mean by like, she's putting her branding on it, but it's not a new product. It's just a product with her name on it. I will also say that shopping in her online store at a computer is feels very different from shopping um, on her mobile site, sorry. Having a very ADHD day today. That's been the norm though. So these are the layer, this was the style of layer cakes that I was initially interested in, but you basically can only buy them as the two sets for $84.66. I definitely want to spend $84.66 on eyeshadow size. I mean, they look like Dollar Tree eyeshadows too. And no shade to Dollar Tree eyeshadows. I have used them for art before. Not art that I was going to sell, but an art challenge I did here on the channel. But I just don't see $84.66 worth of value here. And then she's also got her watercolors. I really considered getting one of the two libraries, but it's $70.88 for how many colors? This looks like a 12 color set. That's very, that is, that is pretty expensive because most professional grade watercolors, when you buy them in a set, you save a lot of money. So you could buy two of the Marmory blue sets for about this price and get as many colors and that's like a brand. I'm, I say that because I literally just wrapped up the Jeannie Dixon review. So I, that's on the top of my brain. I know the price point. And I don't know. Like it doesn't, it kind of looks like Marie's watercolors to me in terms of the packaging. They do look like metal tubes instead of those garbagey ointment tubes. They do have screw caps. Like, you know, but I just don't feel like it's worth the 70 something dollars. I was interested in trying it. And if one of you guys bought it and wouldn't mind sending me a dot card, I would love to talk about them because maybe I'm totally wrong about these. But it just doesn't feel like a $70-ish value for tubes. How big are these tubes anyway? Also, they don't have like... <laughs> they call... They have what I call like paint store names like you go to Home Depot and you're buying like a color for the wall so you pick up great expectations doesn't I'm looking for the size of the tubes I should not have to she has so many words and it's 12 milliliters so that's yeah that's about the same size as a Mary blue tap uh, tube so let me know if these are any good I have a feeling they are white labeled it would not surprise me if they were white labeled from like superior or Marie's that's a that's a pretty popular option I mean look she wants ten dollars for a sponge in a plastic box you could go down the and her sticker you could go down to Dollar Tree and get all but the sticker you know it's it's stuff like this or the the spray bottles for sixty dollars like her art supplies when you buy them from her shop are very expensive so that's why we're not taking a look at anything I did think about the fairy dust dot cards mostly because they're dot cards and they are 
one of the more economical things that she has on her shop. Like, like these, these look like the Niji watercolors that you can get for less than half the price. And I'm, I'm so sorry for, do, for doing this. I, I grew up lower middle class. I grew up a TJ Maxx and a Marshall shopper. I'm still a TJ Maxx and a Marshall shopper. I shop on guilt. If I'm going to buy something nice, I, we always use retail me not, or Joseph is always checking on, Oh shoot. What is the name of that? What's the name of that site? Slick deals or I am sorry if I am coming across as very critical. I, when I splurge on art supplies, it's because I think they're going to be worth the money. And I try to bring that energy to you guys because I know everybody's on a budget. Everybody's got limited income, especially artists have limited income. So I'm trying to like help you guys buy things you like at a good price. And like her water brushes, they, they're selling these at Dollar Tree now, you know, like not that you have to shop from Jane. You can like Jane's art. You can buy Jane's books. You can take her workshops and you don't have to buy from her shop. It's not a requirement. And she does have some like interesting ideas. Like she's selling the neon pigments, which to be fair are going to be fugitive because the way you get neons is from dyes. Um, she's selling like the little baggies of the neon pigments as a whole set. So you can get just a little bit. And she sells the gum Arabic and she sells the watercolor binder. So you could make your own watercolors. Like you could, if you were looking to do that in bulk, you could get all of these things on Amazon and do it. My, my buddy Kabocha did a workshop with us here on the channel about making your own watercolors. Some people even use old makeup to make watercolors, which I don't know about that personally, but I'm saying like there are more cost effective ways to do it, but it is neat that she does it. And if you're one of my Aussie friends and you've been to her in-person shop, let me know if her prices are a little bit lower over there or because like, you know, with websites, sometimes things do get marked up a little bit more because of like shipping and handling and to offset some of the, I know shipping and handling is usually included in the charge, but you know what I mean? Like to offset paying for a website and, but then again, you're paying for physical brick and mortar store. I don't know. Let me know if her prices are lower online. So these are the watercolor watches. Um, this is a superior product. I have talked about these before for you guys. I actually really like them and I think they're really cute. Um, these are the empties. So you could fill them with theoretically your own paint. Jerry's Artorama also sells these under their Creative Mark brand. It is neat to see that, that the empty pans are there. So like at least I could buy the empties and then fill them with whatever colors I want to fill them with from a tube. Like that's kind of cool. Uh, these are some of my favorite travel watercolor sets because of just the fact that they're on your wrist. So they're already pre-supported. I just think they're super neat. But they are a superior product. They are not necessarily a Jane product. I do know how white labeling works. It does seem like maybe she's working with superior for that one in order to have access to the empties and the blanks. They do do that kind of white labeling processing. I believe it's either ODM or OBM processing. This looks like a unique palette of paints specific to how Jane Davenport paints rather than what comes in the set online normally. And like white labeling something isn't inherently bad. And frankly, 1802 USD for this thing isn't inherently bad either, especially if you don't want to buy from AliExpress, which I know people who don't. And I totally respect that choice. And wait long enough, it'll end up on Amazon anyway. So some of her prices are definitely kind of high, um, especially if you're on a budget and you're looking to like, like these are just look empty little lip gloss containers, right? 1286. So um, that's kind of like my big beef with Jane Davenport is she sells a lot of stuff that you really, if you internet and you look around and you talk to other artists, you can find a lot of these things. Um, maybe not with her logo on it, but you can put your logo on it. And they're just kind of expensive for that. And that's what kind of makes me like rah, rah, about it. And she's got a lot of stuff. Like, were we just in mixed media? No, now we're in mixed media. And I think some of them are a better price than others. Um, some of them remind me of my childhood and I just had like a nostalgia blast for the little butterfly bottles. I don't remember what little girl perfume came in this that they sold at K&B, but boy, I just remember like, woo, 
it came back to me. So like, there's a really nice, joyful quality, kind of Lisa Frank, really fun colors, uh, happy planner vibes. You know, if you like these kinds of things, she's got you, she's got the stencils to make making art a little bit more accessible. I think all six layer cake palettes for $253.97 is, is a little, oh boy. And then the art sponges, these are probably the same makeup sponges that you can get on Dollar Tree. I do think though, Frugal Crafter did a comparison between art sponges and makeup sponges because the makeup sponges are cheaper than the art sponges. I did not actually watch that video, but if you're curious about that, you should probably head over to her channel and check that out. She's got a lot of just, she's always full of good ideas. I mean, a lot of these things are very aesthetic. Like this is a dust brush. You guys probably see me rocking that ugly Alvin brush. I'm gonna still use my ugly Alvin brush. Like they're, they're pretty, like you want to have them out on your table, but I don't really care about pretty. I care, even the empty, even the empty is 1286 chain. Ooh, a single one. These are doubles, but a single one is 4703. What, 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 what? Anyway, I'm not so big on like aesthetic art supplies. I'm big on art supplies that are comfortable for me to use because I have Sjogren's and I have a lot of, it's not arthritis, it's the, arthritis is the inflammation, it's the pain. I have a lot of the pain in my hands. So, you know, if it's pretty and it eats my hands up, like no thank you, I'll pass on that. And I can just look at some of these things that are so beautiful and be like, no, 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 that's gonna kill my hand. Ooh, okay, here, why was this not under watercolor? Tell me, big, big makeup vibes though. So uh, this is the Bite Size Layer Cake Mini Portrait Palette. I'll just open that in another tab for later on. Why wasn't that in the watercolor though? Like y'all saw me go through all of the watercolor Normally I am smart and think to go through mixed media, but she has so much stuff though, y'all. Like I didn't expect to spend 25 minutes talking about Jane Davenport's website all by itself, but here we are. Um, so I think I will abridge that and, oh, here's some more of them. Ah, they're so, ex I think they're kind of pricey for what they are, but so this is, this is tempting. So the thing about the layer cakes that I'm talking about a whole lot. Sorry if I'm weirding you guys out. Um, these are kind of like a gouache. So they're a water soluble paint that is a little bit thicker. At least that's what it said a while back. Oh, I, I would rather this one than this one. It's good. The other one has too many neutrals that are too similar to one another. They're pretty. They do look like makeup. I would be interested in knowing what how they're made. So creamy layer cake paint, inspiring palette that will call you to create beautiful, useful colors, water loving media, great for all ages. So probably no toxic pigments in here. It would not at all surprise me if this is makeup pigments in a different formulation. And what would be concerning to me about that is makeup is not meant to be archival. It is not meant to last forever. Not that I even want my art to last forever, but it, Duh. I don't know, the way they formulate it, they tend to go quick. So I'll inv investigate that a little bit more later on, on my own time. There isn't necessarily anything wrong with using makeup supplies for art if that makes you happy, if it gives you the effects that you want, if it handles the way you want it to handle. So, you know, I'm not like criticizing people out there who are actually using makeup supplies to make art. So Let's take a look at her Facebook. So she has this really bright and vibrant banner at the top of the page, very consistent branding. And then we get what looks like a lot of Facebook lives, most of them demonstrating her products. I think this is a great idea if you're an artist who is actually selling a something, whether you're manufacturing it yourself or you're white labeling it or you're working in collaboration with another company. The more demos that you can do showing you actually use these products, the more more faith your audience is going to have in these products and what these products are capable of. And this is something we have not necessarily 
consistently seen throughout the Easily Influenced series. Now, Jane has a lot of products, as you guys saw, and we're getting a lot of stuff on the layer cakes right now. She has the kind of eyeshadow style layer cakes and then the pan pastel style layer cakes, and we're getting a lot of content on YouTube about that. And I don't think that's like her newest release, but it does seem to be a favorite. Maybe that should tell us that these are very flexible and usable products that have a wide variety of applications or maybe it should just tell us that she really likes these products but the fact that she's demonstrating them in Facebook lives taking the time to explain them then she also releases these really cute prompt lists pretty regularly maybe not every month but it's it's pretty consistent although one thing I have not seen is whether or not she actually draws or paints or mix medias along with the prompt list I mentioned in the Jeannie Dixon video that I would love to do prompt lists for you guys but I am not at a point where I feel like I can consistently keep up every single month every single day with the prompt list so let me know if it's important to you for the artist to release um, to draw along with you with the prompt list or if you just appreciate having the prompt list and that it gives you something to do in your sketchbook it gives you inspiration on days where you're just kind of running kind of dry Next up is Instagram and her super cute pupper. And hers doesn't seem to be curated in quite the same way as, say, Jeannie Dixon or as Jenna Rainey, where it is very, very, very curated. It seems to be a little bit more of her products, her pets, and what she's working on. And there's also quite a few carousel or shoppable images, although I'm not currently seeing a whole bunch of reels here. And I know that's something that Instagram really heavily pushes and that artists who are not using reels or reusing stuff from TikTok may find themselves penalized in terms of the algorithm and who actually gets to see their work. Finally, we see her YouTube channel. It's not quite as fleshed out as her other social medias are. And while there is some content here, I do kind of feel like a lot is being held back for the classes and workshops, which makes sense. She's selling those. She's charging money for those. She would like you to take them. And why give away all of the information when you can save some back and make a little bit of income? It's something that a lot of artists do. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of artists have Skillshare or Domesticas, so that makes perfect sense to me. But she does still have a lot of stuff on her YouTube. YouTube channel a lot of it does seem to be product demonstrations so if you're curious about the products that she has in her shop how they might be used how she handles them she does have some content here where you can see how they're being used and maybe get some ideas for how you could use them, them yourself which I think is very smart for any of these artists who are going to do branded merch is you really want to make sure you show your audience that you're using it you're demonstrating it and you're giving them ideas.
Hey y'all, so today we are going to talk about the second book, Fabulous Figures. And I also want to let you guys know I actually ordered the layer cake set. It was more expensive than I figured. So this is this review is gonna be even longer than I expected. Also, like check out my very cute mushroom outfit today. Can I can I get some props for this? It just came in and I I love it. I had to pair it with one of these halters. Very cute. Anyway, we're gonna talk about fabulous figures today and boy do I have some thoughts. Also, I don't know if you could see him, I don't know if he's gonna show up in the shot, but this orange gato that is hanging out with us is Dax. So those of you who watch the craft streams, y'all remember the day we found him as an itty bitty little kitten. He is my mom's cat, but he is hanging out with us today. He loves to be outside with supervision, so I thought, why not give you guys a little treat, a little cute cat in the background. I'll be keeping an eye on him in the viewfinder as well. So if we got a dash inside, we got a dash inside. Speaking of dash inside, the weather says it's going to be overcast, but not rainy. We will see. So this was published by Get Creative 6, the same people who published D Jeannie Dixon's Hello Watercolor. And the quality of the book itself seems higher than Quattro's Beautiful Faces. It just seems like it's a better made book. It also has some inclusions with it. The black and white inked illustrations on the front cover interior are really pretty. They give me big shoujo vibes. So just like we talked about in Beautiful Faces, if you like this kind of big eyed expressive look, y'all need to look to manga. And I'm gonna have some recs for you guys. The table of contents is easier to read, but it is still too hard to read-ish and it's kind of too small. You guys will see, maybe you'll see, if the camera can even pick it up. In her introduction, Jane mentions being taught a method of measuring the body in head proportions. And I was wondering, because I have a comics background and she has a fashion background, if we're talking about the same head scale that comic artists frequently use, um, with heroic proportions being like eight heads and like realistic human proportions being about six heads, Spoiler, I draw my figures at six heads, which is why they all have huge heads. And then you go into chibi proportions where it might be three heads. And the, what that means is you're breaking up the body on the size of the head. And it's just a way of measuring it. And the more you practice it, the more it becomes second nature. And the more you draw from reference, the easier it's gonna get. I've got a bunch of tutorials on figure drawing here on the channel. That's one of my big passions. I really enjoy figure drawing. So I'm also gonna have some sidebar tutorials for you guys as well. Uh, I admit it takes a while to learn this method. She mentions developing her own method as someone who teaches figure drawing to kids and teens. I'm curious how our methods differ. Nothing substitutes for real life observation. So that makes me wonder if she's going to talk about figure drawing and drawing from reference. I was very hopeful that we were gonna get like some real lessons with some actual figure models in this book. She says it takes confidence to go to figure drawing sessions as someone who has gone to and hosted figure drawing sessions, it does, but it gets a lot easier as you do it. And there are online options that don't take any more confidence than just drawing. So you have some options. I'm going to link them for you guys. We have options for both new drawing and leotard drawing. Uh, some of the tutorials I'm gonna share in this video, I'm using reference from Adorka Stock, who I highly recommend. She does leotard pose references that are a little bit more action oriented because she is a fan of Sailor Moon. So a lot of it was initially inspired by that. I love it. She's a great reference. You should check out and support her work. Man, she covers a lot of my gripes about her work in advance. For example, the non-realistic fantasy proportions and all women and no men. So if you want resources for figure drawing, you need to learn the rules so that you can break them. Uh, and I would recommend that you guys check out Glenn Vilpu and Proko. Proko's here on YouTube. I'll link them for you guys. Or you can even check out my resources if you're interested in learning to draw for comic's sake. She shows her workspace on page 15, which y'all know I've been like clamoring for show your workspace, show your workspace. We want to see how you work. We want to see your mess. And then on page 20, she introduces her method of breaking up the human figure. And it is this heart method. And <laughs> I'm going to complain a lot about this heart method. Now, to be fair, I am not here to yuck anyone else's yum. 
if it works for Jane, that's awesome. If it works for you, that's awesome. But I'm going to point out it has a lot of significant drawbacks and failure points that if you're learning anatomy, you may struggle with this. This might not be a helpful book for you. And I'm going to try to share some additional resources because we do all learn differently and we do have different drawing needs. And I labored for years trying to learn from the early Chris Hart how to draw manga books and the early drawing books. And I just did not make any improvement at all until I found Glenn Vilpu and Andrew Loomis. So different needs are going to vary. And hopefully I can point you guys in the direction of some resources that'll be helpful for you. So the heart proportion thing I can kind of see, but it's going to mostly give you one body type. But this is Jane style and fashioned up inspired. So I'm going to go with it. And I've been really trying to push myself to draw more ver variety in my body types. And it's something I struggle with and I need to be better at. I owe it to my readers and my audience to depict more diversity in my work. So I am a little bit frustrated. It's resources like this that only really teach one body type or one way of thinking that I think make it harder for well-intentioned artists to actually make the improvements that they need to make. I'm glad she uses a photo reference to demonstrate her heart method. It really makes it easier to understand. And I'll be real, if you have body dysmorphia, this book could be triggering. So skip this book if that sounds like you. Um, it's very Barbie doll proportions and the Morpho books in general have better body inclusivity. And I say this as someone who does struggle with body image issues. Flipping through the book was starting to kind of get to me. If this is a struggle for you, give me a sec. Even being familiar with Jane's art, I wasn't prepared for page 23. So I'm going to give you guys a warning and then I'll let you guys know when you can look again. And it's not, it's not nudity. It's just on the note of body dysmorphia. It can be, <laughs> it can be a little, it can be a little much. Okay. So this is basically Jane proportions for pretty much the whole book. Very, 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 very slender. And I realize that um, that is what they teach in the fashion world, but this book isn't aimed at fashion illustrators. This is aimed at people who want to draw beautiful figures. So I wasn't prepared for that, for that level of like body, not intentional body shaming, but it feels a little body shaming. And I'm not saying like, Jane did that on purpose or Jane feels this way. I don't know Jane Davenport at all. I cannot read her mind. I cannot put words in her mouth. But as someone who has read so many how to draw books, this is such a problem with how to draw books. And it can be extremely upsetting, difficult to deal with for a lot of people. So um, I just wanted to give you guys a warning. You can look now. I put it away. If it doesn't bother you, that's fine. I just don't want to hurt any of my friends, uh, especially because when, as I was reading it, I was kind of being like about it. So there are, these are definitely from the fashion design world in terms of thinness, height, and landmarks. So I wanted to try doing a larger girl using her heart system. And I mean, ish, even if you adjust the limb length and the proportions, they're still going to be wasp wasted. And that's still pretty limited in terms of body types. There's been a lot of pushback in terms of inclusivity and plus size models to not just include plus size models or larger size models who have like the hourglass figure, but you show more diversity in body type. So using her heart method, you're really not going to be able to depict a variety of body types. On page 28, she refers to wide shoulders and bottom heavy as heart trouble. Um, I didn't really, I, she's trying to help you troubleshoot like, you know, areas where if you're trying to replicate her style, you might not be successful or how you might have messed up. But like there are people with wide shoulders and there are people who are bottom heavy and both can be very attractive and beautiful. So I'm over here like, where was your reader? Where was your beta reader for this one, Jane Davenport? Where your 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 publisher did you dirty? Especially because when it comes to artists, artists are built in all kinds of body types and gender identities. So, you know, um, if you guys want more gender inclusive how to draw people content, I got you. And I want to do more size studies though. So stick around. We will do those together because that is an area I need to be better about and I need to improve about. And if I'm going to complain about it, I need to step up and make that kind of content. 
I have some body dysmorphia, so I point these issues out to help others with this issue and to point out other options, especially since we are talking more openly about eating disorders and disordered eating and body issues and the effects of growing up with very uh, narrow frames of viewing a good body or an appropriate body. I want to kind of push back against that. Um, and even in my own art, while I'm not perfect about it, I do try to draw people with more body types and you know, uh, more realistic proportions because for younger readers, it can cause a lot of problems. Page 34, she offered tips for juicy figures, but it's still all straight sizes and it doesn't offer any demos. Like she really does not venture too far out. Is that her idea of a juicy figure? She doesn't really venture too far out of this very small comfort zone. And then on page 36, page 36, I made the note. So a fabulous figure is a fashionized figure. And uh, whoo, what a wasp nest. Not just meaning the waist size, like not just a pun to the wasp waist, but also like I am not, I realize me pointing these issues out could be really stirring the pot. I'm not, not calling for a dog pile, not calling for anything other than publishers and fellow artists just do better like we can be better this book was published in 2018 we we could this is like 2010 vibes in, in terms of like body types uh we can do better and then even kids are on the heart system you know how we get those waspy wastes and i i don't know i i i don't love that I, I don't love that. So um, she spends a lot of time on what she refers to as lolly legs on page 46 and small variations, like 10 pages of variations, but just one page on juicy figures and not even talking about other types of bodies. So, you know, it's kind of like what we say in the, in the, it's kind of like what we say in the margins, like what we say by not saying it what we say by what we pay attention to. This is the lolly legs page, by the way. And look, they're like, they're stick legs, y'all. Um, it is definitely extremely stylized. The shoujo manga that I'm telling you guys, you ought to check out is guilty of this with some wonderful exceptions. I understand we live in a problematic and flawed world. I'm, this is an area that maybe I can do better in. Uh, the heart analogy falls apart with the side pose. And that would be on page 58. I mean, it falls apart pretty quick. It's basically good for like front pose and back pose. And that is about it. So to me, that's not a system. That's like a cutesy way of thinking about things to help you remember, but I wouldn't call it a system. So I have a demo that I'm gonna include on one of the two sides that I did for you guys on how I draw Figures. I have a lot of tutorials here on the channel talking about how I draw figures. It is, I'm a comic artist. It's important to me. Um, and I also have a quick figure drawing demo, like I said. So this one here, this is two body types. It's not even all inclusive. Um, this is what she would have called a juicier body type. I would call that a pretty standard, like thin standard body type. And then this is a larger body type and it's not even as inclusive as it could be like I said I need to practice that more and do some more studies and share that with you guys but today is just not that day on page 60 this method seemed very guesswork like Jane can do it because she has years of practice but you're supposed to grok it immediately or at least on your own just from this book of course she also has you know the workshop that goes with this but considering how much gets kind of like glossed over I don't really have high hopes. So this is her drawing the side of the figure. I don't really have high hopes that it's going to get a lot more in depth than what we're seeing here. But if you have taken this workshop and you liked it or you didn't like it, let me know. I would love to hear about your experiences. On page 68, she says, from a purely instinctual level, we are hardwired to notice expressions. She didn't teach expressions in her book, Beautiful Faces. And I asked, is she going to teach expressions in Fabulous Figures? No, no, she doesn't. No, I got y'all, friend. I mentioned that already. Uh, on page 70, nothing beats observing and drawing from life. Those are true words and people should write about and demonstrate that more. And she doesn't really demonstrate that in this video like not in this video, in this book, like, at all. 
On page 72, I do like that she talks about simplifying with size, and that's in reference to simplifying faces as they get smaller. On page 74, she says, I could write a whole book on drawing just the turn face. <laughs> and I wrote, but are you even going to show us how? I have a sidebar demo that I'm going to share with you guys. And she also has an exercise on page, is it 74? I think it is. This is the drawing of the faces where she doesn't really talk about it, but she has this whole exercise that she wants us to do along with her. And I like the exercise. I just wish she would explain it more. Are we supposed to draw more faces in, up in here? That would be kind of cute. Are we supposed to paint our own faces? That would be fun, but we would need some instruction on that. Are we supposed to, are we supposed to learn how to draw a side view face? Cause she does not teach us that. But fortunately I got y'all friends. I'm gonna have a demonstration over here for you guys. And if there's ever anything specific that you would like me to do a mini tutorial or even a full blown tutorial on, and I haven't done it and you have checked, let me know if you want to know if I've done it. Ask me over on my Discord server, the paint box. I'll put a link down in the description for you guys. I'm happy to go looking for you guys because sometimes I don't name things in a very intuitive way. And sometimes YouTube search is garbo. So on page 76, she has a demonstration. And I wrote, if you want to learn how to draw faces, Jane's way, this book ain't it. Just not enough information, not enough in depth. And Beautiful Faces helps some, but it was also not as in-depth as I would have liked. While Jane draws very whimsical hair, this book is no help. And we start talking about hair on page 80 over here. And her art is so pretty. It is so pretty. So I have some suggestions if you guys are looking for inspiration on whimsical hair from the masters of whimsical hair. Akiko Higashimura, the creator of Princess Jellyfish, draws amazing hair, particularly in Princess Jellyfish. Ayazawa, Nana, Paradise Kiss, Neighborhood Story. Her hair is so good. It's so cute. It's so whimsical. And Miyoko Ano, particularly her work with Sugar Sugar Rune, which is a shoujo series, but all of her work is so good. The way they draw eyes is awesome. The way they draw mouths is awesome. The way they draw hair is awesome. A little bit of a warning, with the exception of Akiko Higashimura, who does draw a variety of body types, although not as much inclusivity as we would like to see, Ayazawa and Miyoko Eno draw very, 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 very thin, long-legged women. So if that is, a pro like, if that's going to bother you or trigger something for you, while I love their work, you can skip it. But they draw great hair, and if that's not going to bother you, or if you can just look at the faces, you should really check out their work. I highly recommend it. Jane doesn't demo where the hairline starts or how to even think about parting the hair. I'm just going to like Google hairstyles and just practice drawing them. And that's what I do for the most part, unless it's like a hairstyle I've drawn a million times, is I'll just Google like short curly girls hairstyles and pick some that I like and put the pieces together and kind of draw from reference. So um, I wish she would have mentioned that more. Of course, our approach to whimsical hair is very different. While I like whimsical hair, I also like, you know, some practicality to the hair. But again, comic artist versus fashion illustrator. On, I felt like in this book, she's just trying to cover too much. The, and I'm guilty of that too. So I don't, it's not like a critique critique, but from a book standpoint, she's trying to cover too many topics and she's not going in depth enough in most of them. Like 10 pages on those stupid stick legs. But we can't get like a good demonstration on where the hairline is. This book is killing me. It needs so many demos because she's barely covering anything. I appreciate that she wants to teach her style and in her way, but it's like a run and dash, not enough examples or explanation. There's a lot I could nitpick and grouse that I'm choosing to ignore so that this isn't a rant review. On page 92, her hands are, <sighs> hands are something a lot of artists struggle with. Hands are something AI generators struggle with. Hands are hard. Hands are tricky little boogers. Her hands are real rough. And I am going by what she's showing us in the hero image. This is meant to be like good, inspirational. Look at that hand that fades into the background. Both of those hands, like 
what is what is what's going on here she calls them pyramid hands and they are they are real rough and um i have some d tutorials here on the channel on how to do hands i can also do like a mini tutorial uh but practicing drawing hands is well worth your time you can literally just look up photo hand reference and just pick 10 of those and draw from them and if you sign up for my manga well if you sign up for my mailing list and it's just me talking about art with you guys I send out my manga madness class for free and I talk a pretty fair amount about drawing hands in the manga madness course and if you join me over on patreon then not only will you get access to that but you're going to get access to my from stick to figure class that I teach in person to both teens and adults and that covers more actually than fabulous figures does you'll get access to manga madness and you'll get access to basically all of the classes that i've taught because now patreon allows you to sort stuff out so i have all my classes in one place including handouts including exercises so i have a whole lot more art educational content going on than what i can share here on the channel so you can join me at patreon.com slash soup and I do have some hand tutorials on the channel, but I should definitely do more study, but oof, that hand. Her feet on page 98 are rough too. I feel like um, there's a reason she blacks out a lot of the feet or why she does a lot of the silhouettes, which as an artist, learning, knowing the areas that you're just never really gonna make much improvement on and learning how to turn that into a stylistic aspect of your work and learning how to make it work for you is great and that's important there's all things we're bad at but uh teaching those things is not so great either and charging money to teach those things is uh oof oof as well um i agree that done is better than perfect but you could have just not covered these things or did like literally with her feet she's like i really struggle with feet but done is better than perfect and i agree with the sentiment that done is better than perfect and it's something i have to remind myself and it's something i have to remind my students of i apologize for the change in scenery one of my neighbors is making the most nails on a chalkboard sound I have heard since nails on a chalkboard so to get all of us away from that horrific sound we went inside which is not my choice of venue for these kind of videos but here we are inside my messy messy home so um i agree with jane that done is better than perfect but you could have just not covered these things or did studies to level up before you made the book i have to do that for my in real life drawing classes all the time whether i'm making new demos or i'm recording new tutorials or i just want to practice and have it fresh in my mind before i teach my students it's not that hard to do i'm not commenting on her theory behind all of this for the most part the hearts are kind of the exception because that kind of falls apart but particularly with the feet i'm not really commenting on her theory i use wedge shapes too but how genuinely rough the hand and feet demos are those are not aspirational those are not those are not good on page 100 oh you have to be much closer now on page 100 the strut exercise oh this is not page 100 also not all of these pages have uh page numbers on them so sometimes it can be easy to lose track of where things are so on page 106 i'm sorry the strut exercise looks like a great concept i can add to my walking poses so i'm going to be tabbing this one for later and this is also goes to show you i only tab three pages of things i might want to revisit in this entire book the hello watercolor book was full of tabs of things that i wanted to revisit or look at on page 108 she doesn't provide any instruction on drawing backs and butts just some tips so i'm going to include a little time lapse in the sidebar demonstrating me doing that from reference so not she has images of it but no explanation of the line landmarks no explanations of how to break it down glenville poo my friends glenville poo so this would be fine if it wasn't intended for beginners or if she hadn't given the advice to rely on this book rather than figure drawing classes and i want to look that up so i can read that quote to you guys because I think it's an important one. This is in her introduction. Nothing substitutes for real life observation. And at the same time, as 
I've been developing my illustrative and artistic style, I have clocked up a lifetime of life drawing, which informs my figure drawing and gives me confidence in creating from memory. However, it takes a fair bit of confidence to roll up to a life drawing class and draw nude people. So until you get to that stage, you can lean on my years of experience. For y'all interested in drawing uh, patterns on clothing, so for those of y'all who want to do surface design on clothing, like my sweet mushroom shirt, page 120 is actually helpful. I think that's the other one that I bookmarked because it no wait sometimes these pages want to stick together too no it was not here we go so what I really like about the cross contour lines across the figure is it actually gives a really good view of the dimensionality of the figure and it might help people see the human figure even on paper as a 3d form so I actually really like I mean it's not in the right place but I really like it as like a thought exercise for getting students to start seeing the body as a three-dimensional form or for getting people like me to see the body more as a three-dimensional form on page 124 while we have different approaches to alcohol markers I appreciate the walkthrough and the shading map on 127 so like I mentioned earlier she wants to cover a lot of things too many things so she doesn't actually go in depth much this is the level of in-depth i want to see for all, all of the concepts that she's covering in the book also particularly like the shading map as she included as a reference and a resource she does a collarbone lesson on page 130 but really just glossed over the entire back view so here's here's our lesson on the collarbone y'all remember the back it was mostly just helpful tips so I kind of feel like instead of it being a cohesive how-to book where she thought about how to get students to draw figures in her art style, it's kind of like the things she's interested in get a lot of attention and then the things she's less interested in or more shaky on get glossed over very much. There isn't a lot of actual meat to this book and it could afford to be twice as long with fewer hero images. That's another thing. Most of these have loads and loads of these big hero images, which I like, but in this book, they're taking up space and she is just so lean in terms of actual content that I feel like we could sacrifice a lot of these pretty hero images for more content in the book. It's more of a Jane Davenport art book and less of a how-to book. There is a fabulous figures e-course, but if you're looking for figure drawing lessons, I would not hold my breath. And this book also came with stickers, which I don't need, and um, templates, which I think are helpful for, maybe it's helpful. Do you guys ever do these kind of punch out things and do you actually use them? Would you find these kind of templates to be helpful to you? Let me know. I think I just get too, I think I learn a certain way and I get very caught in like, this is how I learn and I don't learn these other ways. So sometimes I can lose focus on actual art tools that could be helpful to other people that just aren't that helpful to me. So while Fabulous Figures is very pretty as an art book, it has some really big flaws as a figure drawing book. And it's not a figure drawing book that I could recommend to anybody who is just getting into figure drawing, learning how to start figure drawing, or who is unfamiliar with drawing the human form. It is not that book for you. If you are an intermediate artist who is already familiar with how to draw figures and you're looking for some inspiration on how you can shake up what you're doing, how you can change things, how you can loosen things up, Fabulous Figures might be okay, but I feel like it didn't go into how she thinks about stylizing things enough. And we spent a lot of space and time on weak points that Jane either could have spent more time practicing and prepping for or just left out entirely. So I cannot say whether Fabulous Figures is for you, but it is not for me and I can't really recommend it as someone who has read so many, so many how to draw books and as somebody who teaches figure drawing classes. That said, we have very different use cases. I'm a comic artist. I make comics and I teach comics. I am not a fashion illustrator. I'm not interested in fashion illustration, but I grew up reading shoujo manga, which is where the two worlds do collide. So if you like this style of art and you're looking for inspiration and drawing tips, 
Some of the How to Draw Shoujo Style art books, often not the ones offered in the US, unfortunately, I will try to link some good ones down in the description below for you guys. Those might be exactly what you're looking for and they might be more helpful. But in the end, if you're gonna be drawing figures, I cannot recommend Glenn Vilpu's drawing manual enough. The only downside with the drawing manual is it is in and out of print and it is very expensive. So I really wish libraries would try to get like a license to have it as an ebook because it is an excellent drawing reference that I highly, highly recommend. If you're also interested in learning how to think about drawing, Drawn to Life Volume 1 and Volume 2 by Walt Stanfield. He used to teach figure drawing to Disney animators. Phenomenal books, so helpful, well worth multiple reads. I've read them several times. As well as the How to Think When You're, You Draw series, very helpful, as well as Grizz and Norm's Tuesday Tips. All of those are really, really helpful resources that will encourage you to think analytically about the drawings so you can make the art your own instead of just copying what Jane's doing. Because in the end, I think both of us want you to find your artistic voice. So I have read Beautiful Faces and Fabulous Figures for you guys. I hope that these reviews were helpful for you. Jane has a lot of books out and unless there is a standout one that you guys think I should read because I do like her art and I think her techniques are really interesting and I am always looking to liven up my work. These books were just not that helpful for me in this time. Let me know if she has some books I might like better down in the comments. I have ordered the layer cakes. They were very expensive. This is why I don't order things from Jane Davenport's shop. This is why I was like, I'm just going to get the Michael stuff. But Michael's is working with Josie Lewis now. And I have a video about that coming up as well. So keep an eye out for that. So uh, I will see you guys when the layer cakes come in so we can unbox and swatch them together. This rather festive little box came for me from Australia from the from the inimitable Jane Davenport. I know what this box contains. I have hinted at what this box contains. Hopefully this box actually contains it because I haven't actually opened it yet. But I figured why don't we take a look at it together. This box 
is very well taped up. Jane has marked it, looks like correctly, with sale of goods. And then the description of contents is art pastels. While that's not exactly it, I would say that's a, a fair descriptor. And the price in AUD does look accurate. I point this out because sometimes people will mismark things. I don't think I've, other than I think from the thing from Temu, which uh, that's that was a whole other video. I don't think I can remember anybody marking customs orders incorrectly, but I just wanted to give kudos where kudos are due. Inside are some cornstarch packing peanuts. I appreciate that. And my package, which is very, very, very cutely wrapped. Actually, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to just talk about this. And then oh how cute! A rainbow pencil! I did not order that. That was a bonus. It comes with my invoice. And I just want to make sure my invoice doesn't include any personal information. It does, so I won't be showing it. But the invoice actually says what I ordered, the price, the every everything. So if I needed to submit this, <laughs> I needed to submit this to my boss, it would be very easy to do that. And I really appreciate that. It also makes it easier for me to talk about prices when I don't necessarily always remember the prices. I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the handwritten note. And inside is a little mixed media card. I think it's just meant to be some encouragement. I appreciate that. Kind of similar to the postcards that I send out. And the little note says, have fun, Becca, with a little smiley face. So I just want to take a moment to say... The packaging is beautiful. I really appreciate the fun little freebie. I have ordered a few art influencers slash influential artists art supplies as we've seen. And this one feels like in like a super nice way. This one feels like I ordered something from somebody's Etsy shop that they really care about and they sent out and they packaged with care. And that's what I try to put into my own shop orders. So like I love, I love to see it. Did Jane package it herself? I don't know, but I appreciate the time and the cute packaging and the cute sticker. And look, I am a sucker for something that feels joyful, exciting, like it is a gift. So this is a way to win some points in my book. Inside is the Jane Davenport Layer Cake Paint Sweet Treats Palette. On the back, we have the colors Macaroon, Cake Pop, Lemon Sorbet, Cheesecake, Cupcake, Red Velvet, Genoise, Neon Musk, Pavlova, and Black Forest. Actually, we don't get all of these here. Like, I've never had a Pavlova. I've never had a Genoise. I'm not sure, other than perfume, what musks are. I've had some of these, though. And there are tape dots on either side. So... I really appreciate the packaging. If she is white labeling this, I appreciate the time, energy, and effort she has put into making this more her own product, making it feel more personalized. And I do, let me also say, I know people white label things. I don't actually have a problem with people white labeling things. There are some companies that make great watercolors that are not available in the US that are excellent options to white label for. From. There are a lot of hidden gems out on the internet, and going and finding those hidden gems and sharing them with your audience is totally valid. So inside our palette, inside our packaging, we have a swatch card. I have to say, this is like business card paper, not really the best thing to swatch on. Obviously, we're going to be swatching on other types of paper today, so this is not the end-all be-all, but... It's, it's not going to reflect well in the paints. The palette feels pretty substantial. It has the colors on a sticker on the back. It feels like a makeup palette, which is not necessarily a bad thing. We've talked about aesthetic art supplies, and there's a lot from the makeup world that would work really well in form factor with slightly different formulation as an art supply. A lot that would be fun to use as an art supply. So just because it looks like it's in an eyeshadow palette doesn't make it a bad thing. Now, let's go ahead and open her up.
Now, inside, she looks incredibly like a makeup palette. Like, if I didn't know this wasn't eyeshadow, I would think this was eyeshadow. Some of my pans are, unfortunately, a, a little bit damaged, a little bit worse for wear. Um, everything was packed pretty well, so I actually don't think it was damaged in transit. I wonder if it was damaged before it arrived. In the end, though, it's cosmetic damage, hopefully. Not actually how it handles, not actually the product itself being damaged. So we're going to make a note of this, but we're not necessarily going to be upset about it unless it does actually affect how these handle. Now, I don't see a brush, but I don't remember it saying it came with a brush. So um, I am going to go get a watercolor brush and I'll be back. So Bowie's on my lap in case you guys can hear him. He can be kind of talkative, but he wanted to hang out. So I am going to try swatching on her included card first before I move on to my own paper. So with layer cakes, let me actually read the listing for you guys. That way we can all be on the same page. And this little palette is very, very cute. It is available in a few different sets and you do need to look in the mixed media section for these. So we're not gonna explore the shop too much because we have done that. We don't need to do that. I believe it is in the mixed media section. And you guys can see we have the color wheel layer cakes. I think for me that would just get very messy. So I wanted something that was a little bit more compact, a little bit more discreet, and had all the colors, or at least colors that I could see myself mixing. This is the layer cake bundle that we had talked about as well. It's a pretty hefty, hefty price tag, and I really <laughs> could not justify that at this point in time just to see if I liked the product, especially considering I was paying for shipping. So some more layer cake bundles, some more layer cake bundles. Here's the food truck one. It's 4703. This is, I think, the double colors. Here is the empty palette in this style. You guys can also see it comes in different styles, like the circles. And then the, the eyeshadow tins that kind of remind me of, like, Walmart eyeshadows from the 2000s, like Jane eyeshadows. Hmm. Same name there. I don't think there's any relation. I just thought it was kind of funny. Uh -huh. And here we go. This is Secret Ingredients. This one has more neutrals in it. And then this is the bundle, I guess. Let me click on Secret Ingredients. Oh, there's the one. In the shot, there is a little brush. It looks like a little makeup brush. I don't think I got a brush at all. Layer Cakes in a Bite sized Palette. Secret Ingredients has a muted palette of portrait colors from the Sushi Roll palette in addition... What? What? Huh? Did I click the wrong thing? Uh, let, let's, let's try it again. Secret Ingredients... No, I ordered the sweet treats. Oh my god. <laughs> I just did a, a craft fair this weekend, so... Even though I am trying, like, really hard to have my act together. No! Didn't I click Sweet Treats? Y'all will have to tell me. Okay, this is, okay, alright, alright. So this is Sweet Treats. This is Sweet Treats. Jane, you're confusing me. Alright. Creamy layer cake paint, inspiring palette that will call you to create beautiful, useful colors, water-loving media, great for all ages. Is there no information about the sweet treats okay I guess not I guess it was copied over from secret ingredients and not rewritten so we're gonna take this with a bit of a grain of salt secret ingredients has a muted palette of portrait colors from the sushi roll palette with the addition of lavender ghetto from the ice cream slice palette so that's what it looks like here it has its name printed at the bottom as well we have a couple of videos I'm not really going to watch the videos here what Jane says, the small form of the palette is handy for travel and smaller creative spaces. And it is actually a little bit smaller than her 12 color palettes, which I have reviewed here on the channel and which some of you guys really like. Spoiler, these contain Mungyo paints. So if you like Jane's paints and you can't find them locally and you don't want to pay for shipping from Australia, they're Mungyo paints. You can order them from Amazon if you'd like to do that. 
And just like the watercolor pans, once they are empty, you can refill them with watercolor or even transfer a small dose of layer cake from the large pans with a palette knife. What you might like to know, each layer cake palette comes with a swatch card, I guess. That is that right there. So, sweet treats, secret ingredients, both palettes, mini ink brush. I don't think I got the mini ink brush. I don't know if it was supposed to be included. Honestly, I was looking for more information about her layer cake. So let's search the site. Maybe she's got like a blog post about it. Lots of layer cakes. Those look so much like makeup, like even the way they are imprinted, they look like makeup. I'm just trying to find an article, like a blog post that just talks about the layer cakes and maybe talks about what they're made of. This, this is a listing. This listing here says Jane's creamy opaque watercolor paints are like nothing you've ever painted with before. These dreamy paints dry to a matte finish, which makes them ideal for layering with other mediums. Rainbow cake is like a super duper layer of layer cake of colors and with fun names like red velvet, blueberry tart, and mint sorbet. Everyone will be hungry for these. Their opaque coverage on light and dark paper is magical. And those are actually, they, they definitely look, <laughs> sorry, word salad time. They definitely look like eyeshadow. That's not necessarily a bad thing. For best results, do not oversaturate the paint pans with water or leave the brushes in water for an extended period of time or overnight. After use, let the paint cakes and brushes dry and store with the cover closed. Do not leave in extreme temperatures. Thick application may need a spray fixative to stop color transfer. I do wish all of this information was in a more centralized location. I don't like having to dig for information about products. I know we have to sometimes, but I, I still don't like it. Anyway, this seems like maybe not all of the information, but basically what we need to get going with these today. Since I don't have a brush provided, I went and got my own, and it is a silver black velvet, so a fairly small brush, and I'm going to attempt, this looks like it's supposed to be a mixing surface, but it feels like it might just be plastic or melamine. I am going to attempt to swatch on this little card with a cat on my lap, which I know will make some of you guys very happy. So once we kind of add some water, it does lighten up quite a bit. And look, I'll be real with you guys. I am not expecting like professional quality out of these. I don't even really know what I'm kind of <laughs> kind of hoping for like a fun gouache esque experience something that can what is why are you like this what is up with you why are you like this something that is kind of compact colorful uh, can be used to add details later on let's be real these are probably not high grade art supplies right like these are probably not going to be super light fast it is hard for me to get into those tiny little spaces with Bowie on my lap I have a feeling they are going to go all over the place. And let's be real, this swatch card is not at all receptive. There's also a hair in here. I'm not sure if it's a cat hair. I'm not sure if it is a Jane hair. That doesn't really bother me. Just kind of noticing. I know my phone microphone is really great at picking up all the noise from my computer. Hopefully it is just as great at picking up Bowie purring. I had a craft fair this weekend that did not go very, <laughs> it didn't go terribly. I just didn't make any money. So it didn't go particularly well. So I'm tired. I just want to swatch some pretty watercolors. I just want to relax and have a good evening. And I haven't seen my cat or my rat all weekend. So I just want to spend some nice time with my boys. And with you guys. This card is so small. It is so hard to swatch on. 
the water just wants to beat up. Why why did you include this? Why 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 do art influencers include swatch cards that are not going to give a very good reflection of their art supplies? What I would like to know, what I am curious about, is how this formula, which looks so much like eyeshadow, how it actually differs from eyeshadow. Because when I touched the pans, they kind of felt like eyeshadow. It's got that like kind of soft, powdery, almost like a buttery feeling. And I feel like one of the ways I've seen her use, not these, but like the round layer cakes that look a bit like pan pastels, um, she, I feel like I've seen her use them very much like pastels. And to be fair, pan pastels do handle a lot like makeup. And a lot of her supplies are straight from makeup. Like the sponges, some of the, br a lot of the brushes. So like, I want to know how this formulation differs from makeup. Because often makeup will include oils as the binder rather than say like gum arabic or honey as the binder. Sometimes cheap makeups will include things like talc. So, like, I just want to know how these differ. A little bit of a mean thing to do would be to go to, like, Five Below and pick up a set that... I'm Not that I've seen a set that looks exactly like this, but pick up a set that looks a lot like this and, and, and try to do it with watercolor. And maybe I'll do that in another video. Let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in seeing. My complaint about the paper, you guys can see, it just kind of like beads up on it. It doesn't really soak in. It just sits there because the paper has a coated surface that's just not water receptive. Also, if I'm kind of huffing and puffing, I'm, I'm fine. I have Sjogren's Syndrome. I've probably mentioned that to you guys before. And just one of the effects is that my breathing, me getting oxygen, isn't as great as it used to be. So I... I'm just always winded now, which is fun. I'm fine. I'm on medication. I'm seeing a doctor. There's nothing to worry about. But I just wanted to let you guys know that because, like, I know I sound like I'm, I've am i run a 5K. And uh, I am exercise agnostic. So, you know, that's clearly not what's going on. But I'm fine. These have been drying for 18 minutes. And to be fair, the humidity in this room is at 41%. higher than normal, but... 18 minutes is quite a long time considering the card that she included has a paper coating or has a coating on it that would inhibit the paints from actually soaking in and drying a little bit quicker. Ain't nobody got time for that, so let's swatch on some cotton rag paper instead. I'm going to need to clean out my rinse cup because it looks like chocolate milk from these colors, but let's be real, a lot of these colors look like they would be opaque. Who is surprised that the water looks like that? Fans of the channel know what this is. We're going to be swatching on Blix Cotton Rag Watercolor Paper. I really like this paper. In fact, I'm going to brag on myself a little bit. Recently, I painted some ornaments. These actually need to get mailed out to the friend who purchased them. I set them aside for her. But I used Blick paper for this, and it worked so well. And it was such a delight to paint on. So Blick has become my standard for these swatches, at least as long as I can afford to buy it. When I swatch paints, I always do a little bit of opacity testing, but since these are meant to be more opaque, we're definitely going to be doing some opacity testing today. So I am going to do, I think a double thick line for our swatches. That way, hopefully we can see if there is some true opacity at play. Watching on the Blick watercolor paper, I noticed that the colors are creamy, fairly vibrant, and don't have a lot of granulation going on in most of the colors, with some exception, and there's also a slight weird smell. Also, these aren't delivering nearly as much opacity as I expected or as I felt like the listings promised. I 
I've noticed some interesting things about this palette, but not necessarily interesting in a good way. The colors are creamy, fairly vibrant, but there isn't a lot of granulation going on in most of the colors, with some exceptions. The macaroon, the turquoise color, kind of looks like it might want to granulate. The Genois, the kind of like a buff sand color, maybe might granulate. And the red velvet, which is kind of like a really nice cad red, looks like it might granulate. The neon musk and black forest also look like they might granulate. However, these are supposed to be somewhat opaque. They are supposed to be kind of like a gouache. And I'm really not seeing any gouache going on here. I also feel like there's probably a lot of dye going on in this palette. And I don't believe Jane Davenport promised like professional grade. I I can like rewatch the footage and check, but that wasn't really the impression. I I mean it's in a it's in an eyeshadow palette, y'all. Like I wasn't really expecting super duper high quality while it is kind of expensive for the amount of paint you get and the size of the paints. Actually, on that note, um, I do like that these are kind of larger pans. They're eyeshadow size. Actually, they're small for eyeshadow size pans, but they're a good size for getting in there with a brush and picking up some paint. But you guys can see these are going to be very shallow little metal palettes. And unlike her other layer cakes not the not the rounds but the snap-in ones i don't think you can buy refills she does talk about how you could like refill it by scraping in more layer cake i'm not gonna buy more layer cake to refill this but that does kind of give me the idea that it does have kind of an eye shadowy or like a cream ish kind of consistency if you can scrape it out and then tamp it down and it stays in place that kind of gives that impression also, she is not joking about like, do not waterlog these, do not oversaturate them with water because they are already getting like a little soupy. So if you really like to use a lot of water like I do, or you're going to do a longer painting session like I might, these are going to be more problematic in that regard. I've kind of shaken up how I do my swatches for this one in particular. We have the double wide opacity test. Not a lot of opacity going on. We have our mass tones up here and they kind of continue down here just to give us an idea of how the color is going to handle. Then down here we have our gradiated wash section which is part of the reason I think some of these are particularly dye based. And then we did the thing where I put down like a swatch of water and dab in paint and try to force it to granulate. So next, I'd like to try doing a little bit of color mixing, but I need to change out my water cup first. You can mix some really pretty and vibrant colors, including some really nice greens and beautiful purples and really fiery oranges. But you won't really be able to mix browns, and it may be a challenge to mix a variety of different skin tones with this particular palette. She does have other palettes available, so you could opt to add on. You can mix some pretty and vibrant colors, including really nice greens and beautiful purples and really fiery oranges, but you won't be able to really mix decent browns, and it may be a challenge to mix a variety of different skin tones with this particular palette. She has other palettes available, so you could add on if you like. That said, I know if you're watching this, you are probably a really big fan of Jane Davenport's art, of her art supplies, just in general. So you can probably think of ways you would like to use this color palette. I like her art, but we come from very different use cases. We come from very different mindsets in art. And I don't, I, hmm, I, I, it is an interesting palette. It is not as opaque as she 
as it's been kind of sold to me, maybe I'm not using, you know what, I can always go in and do one more stripe. We can really try to gouache it up. We can really try to give it a fair shake. Not because I feel any like super strong need to stand this palette or to love this palette. I mean, you guys know if I need to be harsh, I'll be harsh. I have, I have no problem with reviewing art supplies and just saying what I gotta say. But she did say that it was capable of more opacity and I was like, you know what? I kind of handle my paints a little, a little loose, a little watery. Let me try to really shin Han past these. Just kind of grab extra paint. Now, you are going to use up more paint this way. You probably know that. That said, I'm not really sure with this color. Wait, okay, so first of all, with the palettes that are available and the layer cakes that are more like, like, like Walmart eyeshadow palette style, not comparing them to Walmart, but just like the style of the palette itself. This is more like Ulta in the sale aisle kind of palette style <laughs> it's a cute palette I'll give her that um that might I could maybe see being able to bring that with me and do more with it with these for me and the things that I paint and the things I like to paint I'm not really super sure you know I say that and then I just saw myself like using these in a watercolor sketchbook just loosening things up using them to add bright pops of color. So like maybe I'm being a little narrow minded with this set and I haven't really like taken it out and given it a chance to play. I do think it is kind of pricey for what it is. Uh, I am sure my Canadian friends and my Australian friends are all laughing at me because usually it's the other way around where American art supplies are the ones that are like prohibitively expensive for you guys because the exchange is not in your favor. In this instance, it's prohibitively expensive because shipping is expensive to pay and it's also expensive on the planet. Um, I've been wanting to try these for a while and I just haven't seen them offered anywhere in person or on Amazon. So I did bite the bullet in this instance. I'm trying to be better about not just ordering stuff from overseas all the time, which is why you guys haven't seen me do a whole lot with AliExpress lately. They are, I can see them kind of opaquing up, not as opaque as a gouache, but considering these are a dry solid product, a little bit better than I might have thought. I'm still super curious about how similar these are to actual makeup. I might do some digging. I might take some notes, check the show notes, because this video is already long enough. I don't want it to go on forever. If I saw this at my Michaels for 20 or under, I would say go for it. It's fun. It's novel. It's interesting. It's doing something a little bit different from what everyone else is on the market. And even if these had their start in makeup, they are fun to play with as they are. And honestly, I cannot tell you who she's white labeling these from because I can't guess. Good on her for finding something that is a little bit more unique and a little bit more original than Mungyo paints or Superior paints and just slapping a different label on it. That's kind of cool. I appreciate that curation. That said, they're not $20. They're $25 and some change. And I had to pay shipping on them. So that does make them a little bit more expensive and thus a little bit harder to recommend to my friends who are not local. Um, so a question, if any of my friends here are Australian and if you live, I believe I said Byron Bay is where her art store is located. Have any of you guys been to her art shop? What does, what is she selling in her? Is it like just like, I don't want to say normal brands because like what's normal to the U.S. might not be normal to you guys. You guys probably have easier access to Japanese and Chinese art supplies than we do here. Um, but is it is is she selling like what the other art supply stores in y'all's area are selling? Is she selling mostly her stuff? I am very curious to know. Mostly because I just like art supply stores. I like visiting different art supply stores when I'm in other countries or when I'm in different cities. And you know like... Just kind of goes in with like the art nerd in me is curious about that. So let me know down in the comments what she's selling in her store. Also, let me know if 
your opinion on this little palette differs from mine. Do you love this palette? Do you think it is amazing? Do you like to use it for like doing urban sketching? Or are you kind of of the same mind as I am that it's fun and it's kind of neat, but it's expensive if you live in the U.S. and probably not really worth importing at that price? I want to hear from you guys down in the comments. One more thing. I want to... This is like a plastic liner. Honestly, this probably had a mirror in its previous incarnation as a makeup palette. Now it has a slightly textured plastic liner. The slightly textured means it's not going to beat up. We were actually able to mix colors on it. That is really cool. Good on you, Jane. Good eye. But it does stain, so it is something to keep in mind if that's something that bothers you. Use another source. Also, um, it is... You cannot have the mixing palette flat and the paints flat, which does cause some problems. There are, because look, look, see how the hinge, it's like a Z hinge. Um, there are probably some ways this could be fixed. I believe this was the same problem with the Paul Rubens travel palette that is also in kind of a makeup format. And while this is fine if you're applying like eyeshadow and you're holding it, or if you have it down flat, you're probably looking in a mirror on your wall or a hand mirror. It doesn't quite work as well for watercolor. One other little thing, there isn't anything. I mean, it's like the name of the, the paints on the back. Uh, but there isn't like a, a ring or a wrist strap or a magnet. So um, as a travel palette, this is probably best if you're stationary rather than if you're moving around. And of course, I'm going to let the paints dry out completely before I close the lid. But you guys can see they are getting just a little bit soupy. Now, I keep saying I am really curious now how makeup compares to watercolor in this regard. There are some people on TikTok, some people on Etsy who will actually grind up makeup and turn it into watercolor. If it's just for them or they're disclosing that that's what they're doing and you choose to buy that, that is your choice. You guys can do that so long as there's informed consent. Who am I to say no? I'm not a fan of that because if it's used makeup, you're, inter in you're introducing human body oils, you're introducing contaminants, you're introducing dead skin cells into your watercolors. Not great. Also, as we talked about a little bit earlier, makeup uses a different binder than watercolor does. Watercolor uses honey or gum arabic or sometimes like an animal high glue or it uses aquazole. These are all hydrophilic. Whereas uh, makeup often will use like an oil based kind of binder, which is going to be, it's kind of going to kind of repel water, you know, mixes together like oil and water. Um, and it may cause staining and degradation on your paper. And also like just makeup pigments are not archival pigments. So like, that's not really so much for me personally, but um, there are people out there who do that. And like, as long as you are informing your customers, as long as they know what they're buying, then I don't really have any qualms about it. It's just not really for me. And I've caught a couple, it's TikTok, so it's TikTok. I've caught a couple of videos because the algorithm knows I like watercolor, knows I like watching people make paint. Uh, they sent me a couple of videos from a creator who was crushing up her makeup palettes to turn into watercolors to sell. And she was complaining about people like me who have a problem with people crushing up makeup to turn into watercolors. And uh, that's why I just wanted to like talk about it just a little bit. She didn't know me. I haven't like expressed this opinion super publicly. I would not ever comment that on her videos because again, as long as her customers know what they're buying, it's their business. I don't really care. Um, but you know, as like a watercolor comic artist, I couldn't see myself using watercolors made from makeup to paint comic pages, right? And like in the end, the lens that I review a lot of these art supplies from is, is it fun? Can I use it on commissions? Can I use it to make pieces of art that someone might put up in their home as like a portrait? Can I use it to paint watercolor comic pages? Does it bring me joy? And if it doesn't do any of those things, it's really hard for me to recommend it to other people. So just because this is so similar to makeup, I thought I would just kind of talk about that just a little bit. 
Now I am super curious about the actual formulation of an expensive eyeshadow as compared to these watercolors. So I'm going to see if I can do some digging. Obviously, we were not able to find a whole lot on Jane Davenport's site. It would be super helpful. Um, and it would just also just be good information to have available as a consumer. Unfortunately, that wasn't really there. So I'm going to go digging. Check the description below and see what I found. So I am going to kind of start by talking about the Layer Cake palette since this is the most recent. And I have to say I was kind of disappointed with what these brought to the table. They weren't really as opaque as I'd hoped. They weren't really as gouache as I'd hoped. But I also, frankly, have been sick and I haven't had a chance to play with them as much as I would like. So if I feel differently about these paints, if I revise my opinion, if I start playing around with them more and I find that I really like them for X, Y, or Z, I'll try to make sure to share that with you guys in the community tab because I have the right to change my mind. I have the right to change my opinion and people can change and grow. But as it's Stands. considering I had to purchase these from Jane's site, considering I had to pay shipping, considering shipping has an environmental cost, especially coming from Australia, considering I couldn't just go down to my local Michaels to pick these up, I would say I don't find them worth it to me. Obviously, you may feel differently. You may live in Australia. It may be a, a much easier purchase for you. So there's definitely a lot of wiggle room where it comes to ease of acquisition and convenience. Now, as for both of Jane's books, if you like Jane's art and you're buying these books because you want books of Jane's art that you can look at for inspiration, I think that's fine. I think they definitely serve that purpose. But as how-to art books, she tries to cover too many topics. She doesn't really give enough explanation of what she's doing for there to really be. There's like one or two tutorials in each book that I would say are tutorials, but there isn't just enough information there really that if you don't know what you're doing, you would be able to learn from this. Also, she's really pushing the workshops that go with these books. And I would be curious to hear from you guys. If any of you guys have taken any of Jane's workshops, what did you think? Were they worth the money? Were they worth your time? Did you really feel like you learned something? Because obviously when we're selling things, we're only gonna share the most glowing reviews as part of our advertisement. So it can actually be hard to find out what people really think about these kind of products. And I would be curious to hear about your experiences, good, bad, or indifferent. Now, as somebody who is a comic artist, I have mentioned this a thousand times, but this means I have to be able to draw figures, right? This means I have to be able to draw faces and expressions and figures and poses and actions and environments and people doing things, right? Um, I did not find either of these books to be particularly helpful as tutorial books, as how-to books, as instruction books. There are better how-to books out there. If you wanna see Jane's particular twist on these things if you're already familiar with how to draw faces if you're already familiar with how to draw figures and you really just want to see how Jane handles it maybe slightly differently from what you've been taught that's fine that said as we talked about in the review particularly for fabulous figures if you have body dysmorphia issues if if this if fashion figures might be a trigger for you if it makes you feel bad about yourself if it makes you feel bad about your body this book is not for you this book teaches a very 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 thin stylized way of drawing women that even i found to be <laughs> kind of harmful and and kind of problematic for me so um you if this is something you struggle with i do think that's worth talking about and I do think it's worth avoiding this book. There are other books that are less. Now that said, if you struggle, if this book is going to cause problems for you, Andrew Loomis's books are also going to cause problems for you. They're kind of revolving around similar, very idealized forms of what a good body looks like and um, neither of those resources are going to be that helpful for you. Even Glen Vilpu, where there are more realistic bodies in Glen Vilpu, often when you're going to live figure drawing sessions, one body type 
tends to be your model. That's what they can get. When I honestly, it just makes us all weaker artists when we don't have more varieties to draw. No one looks like any other person unless you've had significant plastic surgery. We're all built beautifully and we're all built differently. So um, I think that's like a systemic art education problem that is both an issue with who people bring in because SCAD did that too. They also brought in women with just one body type. Um, it's something that we need to work on, right? And there are online resources that address this beautifully. I will link some of them down in the description below for you guys. I know there are several fat photographers and models who are sharing these sort of resources and references so that people can do better and learn better. And I'll link those for you guys um, because I think being able to draw a variety of people and celebrate a variety of people is important. Diversity is the spice of life and body types and different ethnicities and different facial structures are all beautiful and deserve representation. That was a bit of a tangent. But basically what I'm saying is Jane is not alone in this. Jane is not even the worst in this. This is a systemic art education problem. Um, so I'm not, I am absolutely begging y'all, please don't like contact Jane and like fuss at Jane Davenport about this. This is not, she is not the only person doing this. You, there are so many people you would have to fuss at. And she is a product of our industry um, and making a book in response to a demand in our industry. So TLDR, as an art educational book, not neither of these are particularly helpful as a standalone thing. There are better how to draw people. There are better how to draw faces, anything, free content even, available online. But if you want to kind of get some inspiration from Jane Davenport, these might be fine. Uh, that said, you might be better served filling out a library request form and requesting that your public library get a hold of these rather than spending the money to purchase these books yourself because there just isn't that level of helpful, at least, that I found in these books. That said, I have read a lot of how to draw, how to paint, how to draw people, how to draw faces, and I do tend to be kind of picky. And I am kind of comparing it against a huge body of work, especially from my teenage years with all those how to draw manga books that came out in the 2000s that were, the Japanese ones were great, but those were hard to get. So there were a lot of American and Western artists who attempted to fill the market and did so very poorly. So I, I do actually have a bit of a bias against really, really bad, incomplete how to draw books that cause more problems than they actually solve. So um, I feel kind of weird and kind of bad with this review because as we talked about many times, Jane Davenport kind of preceded a lot of the art influencers. That said, she has her crown, she has her flowers, she has her very loyal followers, people who love her work and support a lot of what she does. She has several brand deals that have gone on or are going on. I do not think one negative opinion from one person is going to wreck Jane Davenport's life. And that's not at all what I'm trying to do. I have a lot of respect for her. I do still really like her art. Um, I just didn't feel like she really went in depth with some of the tutorials that she was really qualified to teach. Like she does a lot of mixed media stuff and I would have loved to have learned more about her process and I would have loved to have gotten into her head and seen her sketchbook and seen more of the mess that she makes because I love that about other artists. I don't love the super curated, this is my super white, pristine sunlit studio that is never messy ever. Like that's just not a reality. Um, and not that her studio was really like that, but it, I still like seeing the thought process and the behind the scenes. And I didn't feel like either of these did that for me. But if you guys feel differently, if you like both of these books, if you've taken her workshops, if you like the layer cakes and feel like they're worth the money, no matter the price, let me know down in the comments below. I, regardless of how I feel about these individual things, I still really enjoy spending time working on the Easily Influenced series, reading these different artists books, taking a look at their social media presence and seeing what I can learn from them, looking at the products that they have released with their name on it. All of that has been really fun 
for me. It's really enjoyable. I like seeing how the sausage is made. Um, I would love even more like getting inside their heads and seeing how they think about things. I would love it if one of these artists released like a how to social media book. Even if, even if with so, the way social media works, everything is out of date six months in, it's still interesting to see how people think about things and how like they view their Instagram. Is your Instagram where you post your sketches, where you share your life, where you share your pets, where you share your kids? Or is your Instagram just a portfolio? Or is your Instagram just the place where you sell products? Different artists think about these things differently and it's interesting to see how people think about things. So thank you guys so much for joining me for another Easily Influenced video. Today we were Easily Influenced by Jane Davenport. I hope you guys found it helpful, useful, and inspiring. And I hope to see you guys again soon with another art supply review or tutorial. Bye guys!